graduating uh, with a bachelor's in education. Anytime that I get the chance to fully like perform what I've learned, I get really excited. Um, but when I was praying about what I was supposed to teach on, I felt like I had like a block, like there was like writer's block, but it was what I'm supposed to teach on. And I really felt pressed on my spirit to just share my testimony with the class because these kids are like in high school, they're getting ready for this next chunk of their life where a lot of stuff starts getting real when it comes to the career of their lives. Um, so a little, just very, very, very quick rundown. The Lord has brought me through three suicide attempts, a dark depression, anxiety, um, uh, identity issues. I was very, very, very deep in bondage within the LGBT community. Um, I used to help plan pride parades and I used to volunteer for Planned Parenthood and now I'm serving God in the kingdom. Praise God. Um, so just sharing that, there's no other explanation other than Jesus Christ and what he did and how he came down. God sent his son down to die on a tree for me and for every single one of you guys for your sins. Um, and as we get ready to sing this next song, everybody knows that once you give your life to the Lord, it's not just like hands off, like that's all you have to do. There's hills, there's valleys, there's mountains to climb, and there's valleys to go in. And praise God for every single season that you have to be in. But that's why he is our Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. Jehovah Nisi, he reigns in victory. Jehovah Shalom, our Prince of Peace, no matter what season you may be in tonight, whether it is a drought and this is your last chance to give the Lord full surrender, or whether you are just entering a waiting season, he is your portion. that his yoke is light. So surrender it to him. Stand up and worship with us as we go to this next song.
second take just a quick second and think of who God is to you and what he's been to you has he been a provider has he been a healer has he been the victor in your life tonight has he been a healer is he your savior in this house tonight is he the mighty God of the universe if he is those things to you then I want you one more time just praise in this house tonight. Hallelujah. Is he worthy tonight? Hallelujah. Is he worthy to you tonight? Is he worthy tonight? Has he done enough for you in your life to give him every bit of praise and glory in this house? Hallelujah. Go ahead and sit down before I keep going. Hallelujah. We're going to continue to worship here tonight with our giving. If I could go ahead and have my ushers come for the t- evening's tithes and offerings. <coughs> Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and we worship you for another wonderful privilege and opportunity. It is to be in your house and in your presence here tonight, Lord. 
We thank you for who you are. We thank you for everything that you've done in our lives, Lord God, and in this service here tonight. And we thank you in advance for everything you're going to do in the remainder of this service. We ask, God, that you would take this offering, that you would bless it. You would multiply it for the furthering of your kingdom and bless the giver here tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First thing, uh, we want to welcome our guests here tonight. If there's any guests, won't you give them a round of applause? It's a, a big deal and an honor that you're here with us tonight. And if you haven't already, please make sure that you stop by our Welcome Center in the foyer. We got a gift for you and want to follow up with you on some information. <clears throat> First announcement is the ladies' prayer group will be meeting at Cracker Barrel this week. Meet there at 7 o'clock, and they will have a van if anyone would like to carpool. For the carpool time and address, please see your bulletin regarding that. Secondly, our GCS graduation is this Friday. Kindergarten will start at 6 o'clock, and the high school will follow right after at 7.30. Make sure that you come out and support this year's graduates. Number three, mark your calendars for June the 12th. We will be having an evangelism Sunday packed with testimonies, evangelism, and a move of God. We're blessed to have evangelist Brother Jared Clark coming to minister to us. Do not miss that, those services. And then lastly, summer camps are right around the corner. Make sure that you sign up for SOYC. The dates are June the 20th through the 25th at base camp. We're incredibly blessed to have Pastor James Snow and Reverend M.L. Sanchez back as our morning and evening speakers. We're anticipating what the Lord has in store for us this year. And for registration, please see the SOYC Facebook page. As we go to this next song, um, I wanted to uh, give an analogy. I feel like Jess Wilson tonight, but I was thinking about this. She always does these great analogies every time she speaks. Um, and... I don't know if when you were, um, have you ever played the game where you like start a story and then the next person has to add to the story and the next person has to add to the story. And we used to play that in the car sometimes and you always know the person that is not so good at the game and it gets to them and they try to add to the story and you know you're going to have to like save the story because <laughs> it's going wrong, right? Well, when you think about that with our lives, how many times have we felt like our story was going nowhere or it was going in a downward spiral, right? And there was no way for it to be saved. And along came Jesus, who is the ultimate author and finisher of our faith, who paid the price on the cross. Um, the word says in Hebrews 12, 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And he is now, he is writing our story. When we give him the book of our life, when we give him our story, he's able to write a new story and to redeem the story that maybe we once had, to redeem those horrible past those, those terrible stories in the past, those chapters in the past that we can't fix, but he can redeem. Yeah. And I'm thankful that our God is a redeemer. Yeah. And part of this song was also written from the verse that we know are familiar with, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God has a plan and he has a way of turning things around and I'm so thankful for our God that this is not the end of our story if you have if you have breath in your lungs your story's not over he has more for you and there's always more there's always more to redeem that God can do he's the God of the impossible things so I don't know where you are tonight where you are in your story but I know that my God is a redeemer and he can redeem your story so as we sing this last song would you stand and worship with us tonight as we sing about God finishing our story. In your word, you hold the power, and in your hand, you hold the pen. You say to me, that it's not over and in your plan you hold the end and you breathe life into the dust those dry bones that try to hide 
your thoughts for me are higher. Thoughts of peace and thoughts of pride. And I hear you say, your story isn't over. But you will overcome. I know because I'm the author, and in my hand I hold the pen. There's more to your story, a new chapter.
know that the Lord is still writing your story, will you just give him a little love and thanks and worship? He's not finished yet. He's not finished. Amen. Amen. You can be seated if you like. She wrote that. That's beautiful. I love that. Very good. Very good. Well, it is good to see you on a Sunday night, and <clears throat> I'm amazed this year our weather has just flip-flopped back and forth. I think it's going to be cool again. I'll take it. It's better than sweating, but uh, the Lord is good. He, he's faithful. He gives us what we need in due season, and, and uh, I don't want to be a complainer. I'll take what he has for me. Amen. So glad. So glad to see you. And uh, as, as you know, Pastor and the team, the whole team, the big team, 30, I think he told me 38 people went to Alaska and they're all either flying back right now or have recently touched down and uh, we're thankful that they got to go, but we sure miss them all. So uh, you might want to pray for uh, Sister Kim because if he's tired, er, then she's still got to live with him. So keep her in prayer <clears throat> and uh, all that team. I, I'm thankful to be a part of a church that's doing something not just right here, but all over the place, all over the place. And I just pray that the Lord would cause their fruit to remain and that it would increase and prosper there, touch lives. Amen. We want to continue to keep in prayer, Sister Dora. Uh, we had special prayer for her in our Sunday school class this morning. She finished her treatments earlier in the week, but is experiencing a lot of pain and uh, discouragement. And, and some of you know exactly how that goes. You, you go through chemo, you go through radiation, all those things, and it affects you mentally and emotionally. Uh, and I know a lot of people testify, they go and visit, and they just feel the presence of the Lord there. But it's a battle. It's a battle. So if you would continue to pray for her, and just FYI, her birthday's tomorrow. So you might want to just call her or send her some flowers or something. I know she would appreciate that. Amen. We're, we're glad to have a very special guest in the house tonight. Um, you know, Pastor Jim Crabb, he pastors Imago Day down in Westchester. I got the right town, right? It's down, it's down that way. And uh, he's a very special friend to our family, uh, not just because he's a good man of God, but also because he, he kind of stole Hannah away and put her on staff and, and has her as his worship pastor. Uh, Brother Crab, we're so glad you're here. Would you like to greet the congregation tonight? Thank you, Brother Mark. Great to see everybody tonight. Isn't Jesus wonderful? He's done great things. What great worship. Thank you, worship team. And it's a joy to be here. Uh, this is my second time I got to be here, and I still haven't met Pastor Setzer. So I, I accused Mark and Pam and Hannah of just making up this guy named Pastor Setzer. But uh, I, know he's, I know he's real. I'm going to get to meet him. Amen. So we love you. Hannah's doing a powerful job. Thank you for allowing us to steal her. Praise God. And uh, she is being a great asset to my ministry and our church family. So I love you all. I love Mark and Pam and their family. We love you. We're covenant brothers. And uh, love you a lot. Thank you for letting me come tonight. Amen. Appreciate you. Appreciate this man. Praise God. We're going to look in the Word of God tonight in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. My wife asked me how long I was going to preach tonight. And I said maybe 40, 45 minutes. And uh, her immediate question was, why so long? <clears throat> we'll see what happens. <laughs> Mark chapter 9. I heard that, Pastor. That's right. Blame it on the Holy Ghost. Thank you for that. I See, there it is. It's a word from the Lord right there. Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse number 2. After six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter, James, and John, 
and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. I, I just want to stop right there for a second. This is not in my notes, and I promise not to make this real long. But I find it fascinating that several times in Jesus' three years of public ministry, Peter and James and John got to be like the inner circle. I love that. It's not that there were favorites by any means. God loves all of his people. But I believe that you can be as close as you want to be. I'll say that again because that, that was a good point to just really get excited. You can be as close as you want to be. That, that's just good preaching right there. That there is no excuse if you, if you don't feel the Lord close, then who moved? And, and it, is, it is incumbent upon me individually, myself, just, just Mark Goins, to have as much of God in my life as I really want. And there, there's, no, there's no other explanation of that because God is no respecter of persons. And so here's Peter and James and John, and Jesus takes them up to this mountain apart. And, and it's, an, it's an incredible uh, experience because in that same verse, at the end of the, verse 2, it says, And he was transfigured before them. His raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, uh, so as no fuller on earth or uh, brighter than any bleach could make it white. And there appeared unto them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now, if we stopped right there, I mean, come on, uh, any Pentecostals in the house tonight? What an experience. What, what a mountaintop experience. What a glory experience. We, we've got Jesus suddenly like a curtain being pulled back. And who he really is is being seen. There, there's nothing between him and his glory anymore. But these three guys, Peter, James, and John, they suddenly see Jesus for who he truly is. Glorious. Just uh, almighty. So, so wonderful. Sit set up high, exalted on a mountaintop, and, and in such a place that even Moses and Elijah come, and, and they converse with him. What an incredible, incredible experience. So Peter, Peter speaks up like he often does. God bless his heart. He answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is so cool for me to be here with you right now. I'm paraphrasing, of course. He said, let us make three tabernacles or three memorials. Let's make three, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And in verse 6 kind of explains why he's, there's the word giddy, little giddy. Somebody said that tonight, giddy. Because he didn't know what else to say. They were so afraid. This was such an overwhelming experience. Have you ever experienced something from the Lord that it so overwhelmed you that you were almost afraid? It's like, I, I remember, Missy, I remember your dad. Years and years ago, back on Butter Street, we had one of those Pentecostal services on a Sunday night. And he was so overcome that, that after, uh, after a little while, he told us, he said, I had to go sit down and stop because I didn't know if I could take any more. He was being so touched by the Holy Spirit, just overwhelmed. I've never forgot that because he literally said, I had to stop and go sit down. I don't know that my body could have received any more of what God was doing in his life in that moment. And, and Peter and James and John, they're right here experiencing something that, that we long for, or at least we say we do. We want revival. We want an outpouring. We want to experience God in, in a deeper, in a greater way. And when it happens, what do you do with it? There's the question. There's the question. But it didn't stop right there. Verse 7 says, there was also a cloud now, this wasn't just a moisture cloud that rolled in off the coast. This was the Shekinah glory of God's almighty presence that overshadowed them. And then the voice of Father God came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. Pay attention. 
focus on him. Look at him. It's not about Moses in this moment. Moses' day is behind him. The Mosaic Covenant has come to a conclusion. Jesus has come to turn the page. Jesus has come to turn the tide. That what was before, that was good for its day, but now it's time for something else, something new, something greater, something better. Hallelujah. Elijah, oh, he was a great prophet of God, but it wasn't about Elijah in this moment. Elijah's days were behind him. Elijah, as much as he did for, for God and the power of God, it wasn't about Elijah in this moment. It was all about Jesus. And the father just, I, I don't know, take it as you will, whether it was a mild rebuke or maybe just a kind reminder, he was saying to Peter, look, Peter, I'm glad that my son brought you up here, but it's all about my son. It's all about my son. Listen to him. Focus on him. Get your eyes off everything else. I know you grew up with the stories in Sunday school about Moses, the great man of God, about Elijah, the great prophet of God. But right now, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And then suddenly, suddenly when they had looked around about, they saw no man anymore save Jesus only with themselves. Amen. Amen. I, I want to talk to you tonight about the purpose. The purpose of Pentecost. The purpose of revival. The purpose of a glory experience. My title is The Purpose of Alignment. Alignment. So, so this divine encounter was something that, that would mark these guys for the rest of their lives. In fact, Peter even referred to it in his epistles later on, talking about the glory cloud and talking about how Jesus was revealed to them. We need moments like this, church. We need, we need occasions where we're not just going through the routine and it's week after week. We go to another Sunday service. We, we might attend the midweek service. We, we have our, our private devotions. We have our favorite worship songs. All those things are good and necessary. We need to have consistency, but we also need to have times of glory. We need to have times where we get beyond the norm and we go a little deeper or we go a little higher where suddenly everything that we thought we knew, it jumps off the page and it becomes alive to us. It's no longer just a simple devotion, but it's as if God walked into the room and I hear his voice. The, the timber of his sound of his voice echoes through the room and it echoes through my soul I feel his presence I sense his nearness I can hear his voice speaking into my heart and that that moment of of experiencing the presence of God can be so life changing but but look look in our in our scripture tonight when Peter exclaims out that let's build three monuments, let's build three memorials, these tabernacles. I believe that, especially as Pentecostals, sometimes we get stuck on the mountain experience. We, we think it's the goal. I mean, I'm being transparent tonight. I'm, I'm Pentecostal. I'm thankful for my Pentecostal heritage, thankful that I was raised Pentecostal. I'm not knocking anybody else, but I believe that God wants his people in this world to have more, a deeper, a personal, a close experience. But we, we sometimes get caught up in the experience, and we think it's all about chasing the next experience, about another mountaintop experience, about another glory cloud experience, and we chase after that. When the father has to stop us in our tracks and say, hey, hey, it's all about my son. Listen to him. It's all about Jesus. So getting caught up in, in the, the experience, Jesus himself said this in Matthew chapter 12. In verse 38, 
One day, some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. But Jesus replied to them, Only an evil and an adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. The only sign I'll give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. In other words, talking about his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. That we need to to get our eyes off of chasing the miraculous, off the signs, off of the wonders and chase Jesus, chase Jesus. All these other things will be added unto us, but first and foremost, we got to chase Jesus. Come on. We, we, we want the deeper and the greater and the divine, but we get so off track at times chasing the Pentecostal experience that we've forgotten the Jesus experience, the abundance of his presence, the fullness of his presence, the overwhelmingness of his presence. The Apostle Paul said it like this. You speak in tongues? Well, I speak in tongues more than y'all. So what's that proof? <laughs> I'm paraphrasing again. But that's the gist of what he was, he was telling these people. said, just because you speak in tongues, that don't prove nothing to me. How close are you walking to Jesus? What are you doing for him? How are you living for him? It's not about, it's not about what you manifest. It's, it's not even about necessarily what you experience. It's about the fruit that you're bearing. It's about you glorifying His name. It, quit chasing after the Holy Ghost joy pop experience and glorify the name of the Son of God who died for your sins but rose again with power and authority and still is seated at the right hand of the Father. So chasing the experience gets us off track so what was this whole transfiguration experience about for Jesus himself we we have in uh, Mark's gospel that Moses and Elijah came and talked with Jesus when you read in Luke's account it says that these these men all three they were glorious to see Luke 9 30 they were speaking about his exodus his departure from this world which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Why did Jesus go on this mountaintop? Because he himself, walking in this flesh, still needed to stay in alignment with the plan of his Father. It wasn't about just being glorified. It wasn't about having uh, his own experience where Moses and Elijah suddenly descended from the heavenlies and stood with him and encouraged him or spoke to him. And then his father patted him on the back, said, you're doing good, son. Those, those were, were uh, subsequent, if you will. Those, those were secondary. But the main thing is Jesus, he's, he's focused. He's on a track. He's going somewhere. He, he has a mission to fulfill. He is so on mission that this moment of transfiguration was still about him staying in line with the Father's great plan. The plan of redemption. That plan that would set you and I free from the very foundation of this world. God had a plan in motion. And now Jesus was about to bring it to fulfillment. So there was no movement to the left or to the right. No opportunity to just pause and take a break. It was all about staying on mission. It was about alignment. 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 So for Jesus... I, I, I was listening to a, uh, a Bible teacher this week. You know, there's a lot of things that you can kind of wander and discuss, and some of it, you, you know, it, it, it's good conversation, but sometimes things that are not clearly black and white, you got to be careful about just making doctrine out of stuff that could be yes, could be no. And, and he talked about uh, the question, as, as he was talking about the life of Christ, he said, so... The Bible says that he was tempted in all points, like as you and I, and yet without sin. So the question would be, could Jesus have sinned if he had chosen to? I don't know that there's a real answer given in Scripture. He taught, the man I was listening to said no, that it would be impossible for him, God in flesh, to sin. And yet, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, he was walking in flesh like me, I know how easily tempted I can be at times. I know how the enemy works to try to 
pull me aside, to whisper in my ear, to show me things, or, or to just entice. And I know how easily this flesh can be deceived. The, the spirit's willing, but this flesh is weak, Jesus said. So I, I don't know, and I'm not up here to, to preach a doctrine on this point, but I'm just saying Jesus in this moment knew how vital it was for him to have a transfiguration experience so that he stayed on track so that he could complete the mission. You can think about the rest and make up your own mind on it, but the fact remains, he got in alignment with the Father's plan, and he did. He completed the mission. Hallelujah. But what about us? What about you and me? Because after all, he didn't go up there all by himself. He took Peter and James and John. They were witnesses. They experienced this moment. Uh, Peter, for sure, later wrote about it in his epistles. So, so for these three guys, I, I'd say they could represent you and me because they're up there, and, and it's so overwhelming. Uh, sometimes you don't know what to do. I've seen people, when they experience the presence of God, they've kicked holes in the wall. I've seen them run on the backs of the pews and fall down and bust their head. I, I've seen a lot of crazy things in Pentecost. Some of you, some of you know who I'm talking about. I remember some of that stuff. I've done my little cut in the rug and, and running around and, and yelling and screaming and hollering until I'm so hoarse the next day I can't talk for several days. I mean, we experienced the overwhelming presence of God. And, I, and I'm telling you, uh, some of the stuff that we do as Pentecostals, it, it's not necessarily doctrinal issues. It's just simply, I don't know what else to do. So my body just reacted and I just, I just acted out and just showed out because I didn't know what else to do. Hallelujah. It's all right. I mean, if you stick your finger in a light socket, you're going to react somehow. When the power begins to flow, you're go there's going to be a reaction. Some people cry. Some people fall on knees. Some people scream and run. You do what you do, but you react. You move in the presence, in the power of God. You let him touch your life, and you get something while you're there. Hallelujah. But so Peter and James and John, it was about getting in alignment for them as well. Because the ultimate goal of the universe could only be accomplished if Jesus knew and stayed in the Father's plan. Let me read a few passages of Scripture again. That Jesus himself was all about this. He never used the actual word alignment that I'm using tonight. But you'll see what I'm talking about. Luke 9, 30. <clears throat> they, they were glory. I've read that one. John 4, 34. He said, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Notice the emphasis. It's not on himself. It's on doing the will of God. John 5, 30. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me, and therefore my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. John chapter 6, verse 38 through 40, he said, I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me and not to do my own will. It's about alignment. It's about alignment. When we experience God's presence, it should shape you. It should make you. We, we sometimes, we, we go to church, we experience, we hear, we see, we worship, we sing, and, and, and we're accumulating knowledge and accumulating experiences. But what is it doing in your life? Is it shaping you? Is it molding you? Is it making you something that God can use, an instrument in His hand? We've got to get beyond all of the intake and realize that something inside should be changing so that now suddenly I'm a vessel that my father can take outside these four walls and use to do something. Get off the mountain. Philippians chapter 2, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. The Apostle Paul, he said, he said, let this same mind or attitude, let this same mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He, though he was God, did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, but instead he gave up 
his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. He was born uh, in flesh. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. And if we would just really, really meditate on that passage and understand that Jesus the very Son of God, the Lord Himself, the second person of the Trinity. He came, He humbled, He made Himself subject to, He yielded, He gave up His, his privileges, His own will, and surrendered and walked in obedience to the plan of His Father. So maybe, maybe if I say it like this, it, 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 instead of just simply using the word alignment, maybe I say obedience. But oftentimes we kind of pull back from that word, obey. I got to obey. I mean, I'm not a, a puppy that is in training, or I'm not a little child that my mom or my dad's going to correct me all the time. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am still a son of the Most High God who needs to be corrected once in a while, who needs to be realigned sometimes, who needs to know this is the path to take and not my own. I need, like Jesus said, to learn the direction of my Father and surrender, obey, obey, obey. Obey. Some areas of alignment. How do, we, how do we get lined up with God? How do we understand His plan? How do I know what He wants to work in my life? Well, it, it's, it's, these are pretty basic. But let me remind you that as God's people, uh, you must be a person of prayer. You have to be. If, if, if I... Uh, on August the 4th of 1984, I stood before God and all the witnesses in that congregation, and I made my covenant pledge to my wife, and then I promptly just walked away and never talked to her again. <laughs> yeah, I'm married. I got the ring. Where's your wife? Oh, she's somewhere. Well, how do I know you're married? Oh, I, I've got the license here somewhere. Let me go look in the drawer and see if I can pull that out. Somebody, I think, took pictures. I dressed up that day, had a tux on. I looked good, you know. I mean, that's how a lot of people approach their Christianity, so-called. I had this experience one time, but I got up from that altar, and yeah, God knows me, and I know him. I, I visit his house once in a while. We got our own thing going, you know, me and Jesus. You know, we, we get along pretty good. He knows where I'm at, and, and, and I try to live a pretty good life. You know, that's the attitude so many, especially in our westernized culture. No, no, no. If, if, if I'm going to be in a relationship with someone, I sure better be talking to them. I better be in communication. I better be open so that there is conversation back and forth. You know, you can, you can talk about prayer. We can teach on prayer. But the basic form is this. You got to talk to him. You got to talk to your father and you got to give him time and space to talk to you. It's a conversation and you'll never ever be in alignment with the plan and the purpose of God if you are not a person of prayer. Don't make it harder than it is. Just go sit in his presence. Find that secret place. Like Jessica was talking about this morning. The secret place of the Most High. And he will cover you with his presence. His wings, the Bible says in Psalm 91. Prayer. I get in alignment with God by seeking his face in prayer. Not only that, but his word. Oh, God, help us to be people of his word. His word is truth. And His Word is right. His Word will keep you out of sin. His Word will guide your steps. His Word will teach you and show you what the next step is. I don't know what to, what to do with my life. Well, then get in the Word and let the Father speak to you from His Word. We need to be people of the Word. His Word is light. His Word is life. His Word will save you from yourself. we got to be people of the Word we, we could spend so much more time on all these, but I, I, I want to keep going here. How do I keep in alignment with the Father? Well, I'm a, uh, I'm a Christian who tithes and gives. <clears throat> Can I just say it tonight? I'm not up here to make enemies. Sure don't want to make anybody upset or mad, but if you're not tithing, then you're walking in disobedience. 
I, you know, pastor didn't ask me to touch on this. And, uh, you know, I'm not up here to take an offering for Mark Goins tonight. I'm saying that the Word of God teaches us that as God's children, we should be marked and characterized by extravagant giving. That we are people who are ready to pour out, to give, to support. It, it doesn't necessarily always have to be money, but that's a good place to start because where your treasure is there, your heart is also. But our time and our attention, you know, you need to give more attention than you're giving to some people, to your own spouse or to your children, your grandchildren. Uh, give attention to the things of God. Some people, it, it's like they're doing a drive-by. Hey, good to see you. See you later. <laughs> and, and that's how we treat our walk with God sometimes. God says, no, you need to pause and you need to realize what you're doing. When, when I give my tithes, when, when I come to bring an offering to the Lord, I don't just, you know, like, hey, let me pull something out of here. There's George. See you later, dude. And throw him in the bucket and then, then just get back to whatever else I was doing. I stop and I understand it's an act of my worship. That it's a moment for me to worship the Lord in a different way and say, Father, you've blessed me again. You have given me the ability to gain and increase. And now I want to return the fr first fruits of all that I have and say thank you. And may you be glorified. And may your kingdom expand. And may the will of the Lord be done in this place. Hallelujah. And Lord, by my giving, I attach myself to your plan. What you're doing in Abundant Life Tabernacle. What you're doing on the earth. Lord, this is my point of contact. I'm giving of myself, and I'm becoming a part of the plan of God. Hallelujah. Can I just say it? I, we, we talked about this for a minute in Sunday school. But do you, do you realize that if every person who had an income, I don't care if you made uh, uh, $10 an hour, if you're making $40, $50 an hour, if you would simply tithe, we would have to have so few special offerings because the people are just doing what they ought to be doing. Just saying. Just saying. The battery died. There it is. It came back. Check. There we go. Because God desires for his people to be in alignment in your giving, your, your offerings, and your tithing, that source of income, that will be a direct reflection of if you are in alignment with the plan of God. Okay, I'll move on. You can say amen or oh me. <clears throat> Our serving, how we serve. Listen, there are opportunities all around you. Don't you tell me, well, I don't know what to do for Jesus. Then open your ears and open your eyes. There's announcements all the time. It's in the bulletin. There's ministry going on all around you. You say, well, I don't know if I like that. How do you know if you don't try? <laughs> do something. Do something. Do something for crying out loud. There are people dying and going to hell, but the church has the answer. We are the light of this world. We are the force that God has left here. We represent the kingdom of God, and it is up on you and I to do something for the cause of Christ, for the kingdom of heaven. This world is dying without a Savior, and you hold the answer. I'm just preaching tonight. Serving keeps you in alignment with the plan and the purpose of God. But there's one more area. There's one more. I, I, I believe, you know, Pastor Rex, uh, Brother Rex, he, he touched on this this morning. I believe that another area that God will use to keep us in alignment is suffering. Suffering. 
You see, a lot of people, again, our westernized culture says that you reach a certain point, you ought to be able to put it in cru- uh, cruise control, man. I, I'm just going to be comfortable in my Christianity, and I'm headed to heaven, and, and uh, you know, no problem here, no trials. I've got a good job. God's blessed me with a wonderful family. Hey, look at my house. Everything's great. Hey, I'm, I'm going to heaven, and no problem here. You know what? You're not living in reality. Come on, come on. We all, we, we suffer uh, grief because we lose loved ones, because it's appointed to every man once to die. So as much as I love my loved ones, if the Lord tarries sooner or later, they're going to die, and I'm going to die. There's going to be grief that we all have to deal with sooner or later. There, there will be setbacks. There will be health situations. There may be financial problems along the way. There may be disasters that strike your home or that strike a family member. Uh, there are so many things that can go on in this world because it rains on the just and on the unjust. And that can be good or that can be bad. But listen, I'm telling you that we are in this life and that God will use suffering to keep you in alignment with his purpose and plan in this life. Let me, let me read scripture. This is not just, thus saith Mark. Philippians 3.10, Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Hallelujah. But wait, there's more. And the fellowship of his sufferings. That I may know him not only in power, but in suffering. Being made conformable unto his death. In other words, Paul said, it's going to happen to me. That if I'm going to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, I will go through the same types of things that my Lord went through. That I will go through opposition. I will go through times of misunderstanding. I will go through times of of people just flat out not liking me at all. I, I will suffer. There will be times of suffering. Hebrews 2.10, it became him, talking about Jesus, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to, to be made the captain of their salvation, perfect through sufferings. Think about that. Being made perfect Not through another glory cloud. Not through another transfiguration. Being made perfect through sufferings. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 13. This is the guy who is right there with Jesus on the mountaintop. He said, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Listen, I don't always understand the circumstances that come around in my life and in your life. There are good days. There are bad days. Sometimes it, it's just, you know, there's a flu bug going around and I caught it. Some days I know, as pastor's been teaching the last couple of weeks, there are direct attacks of evil spirits who may manifest through afflictions and through sickness. There may be times I've just made foolish choices and I brought something on myself. I don't have an explanation for every single thing. But I do know, I do know that if I stay in alignment with the plan of God, I'm going through this thing, man. And the devil may try, he may attack, he may rant and and scheme, but there is no weapon formed against me that shall prosper as long as I stay on track and I am in the will of my heavenly Father. Hallelujah. The power and the purpose of alignment is real tonight, church, that you and I have this privilege if you will, to be a part of what is, uh, God is doing. And no, I'm headed somewhere. I'm headed somewhere. Let me wrap this up. Did we hit 40 minutes? Yet? Why do I need alignment? Why do I need alignment? I believe that the true test of our spiritual life is in exhibiting the power or the self-discipline, if you will, to descend from the mountaintop. Let me say that again. The true test of our spiritual life is in exhibiting the power to descend from the mountaintop. Come on, we would all love to stay up there. We would love to stay in that glory, to feel the presence of God, to hear His voice, 
to, to have something literal happening that was affecting his physical being. Jesus didn't stay the same physically in that moment. He, the glory that was within him was revealed and he shone so bright. Moses had a similar experience when he was on a mountaintop. Remember that? That when he came down, the people were afraid and asked him to cover his face until it kind of wore off. Listen, there are moments where there needs to be a reality of the power of God at work in our lives. But then what do you do with that? Where are you going with that? We show maturity. We show that we're in alignment when we are willing to experience and then descend from the mountaintop. God will not allow us to stay on that mountaintop. It's not his plan. You see, I want you to look at this with me. When Jesus came down with his disciples, if you read the rest of that story, because it didn't end there. It was still the same day. As they, as they came down the mountain, they, they had a little conversation talking about it. That's another lesson, another message. But in verse 14, they reached the bottom of the mountain, and, and it says, He came to his disciples, and he saw a great multitude. Listen, you know why God gives you mountaintop experiences? So that you can come to the multitude that's looking for answers. They were, they were looking for Jesus. They'd heard stories. Some of them had, had literally experienced healing power, deliverance power. And they told their dad. They told their cousins. They told their aunts and uncles. And so they went looking for more of Jesus. Because if he did it for them, maybe he'll do it for me too. There was a multitude. This world is looking for something. And it's time for the Christians, the saints of God, to descend from the glory cloud and take what they just received and be ready to distribute it, to share it, to show it to them and say it's for you too. But it wasn't just a multitude. The Bible says that there were also scribes, Pharisees. They were questioning with the disciples. You know, there's always going to be religious arguments and disputes and questions. There are some people that they will never really get close to God because they always want to stop and argue about something. I don't understand that. I know some people that every time you meet them, they've got something else they just want to argue about. They're so contrary. I don't know how there's any joy in their heart because all they want to do is argue. And they're supposed to be Christians. They're, they, they, they've had an experience with the Lord, but they want to dispute this and they want to condemn that or they want to point at these people and say, well, they need to or, or she didn't. And, and it's just on and on and on. Listen, the, the biggest problem that Jesus had as he ministered on this earth in those three years of public ministry was having to deal with hard-headed, knuckle-headed religious people who were so far away from God and they did not not truly understand the plan of God but Jesus dealt with them and God has left you and I here to deal with them we got to help them I don't I don't want to stand up here and condemn them I want to help them if I can if they'll just listen but it didn't stop there not only was there a multitude not only were there religious disputes but the Bible says verse 17 that one of the multitude said master I have brought to thee my son, which has a dumb spirit, an evil spirit working in this young man's life. Who, wheresoever he taketh him, he, he teareth him. He foams and gnashes with his teeth. He's pining. When, in other words, he's getting weaker and weaker. And I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. There are, there are families in distress. There are people that are looking, they're, they're running to this doctor, they're going to that psychologist, they're, they're calling counselors, they're, they're calling up Aunt Susie on the phone. They're looking for anybody they can talk to because they're in distress and they need somebody. They need somebody. And guess what? You are our somebody. But lastly, as that man said it, I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't do anything. There's a multitude looking for answers. There's, there's people wanting to uh, be religious but argue and dispute all the time. There's families in distress, but there are so, so many powerless Christians in this world today. 
and they're failing on mission. They're not in alignment. They're not in alignment. Listen, you can believe sincerely. I, I, I was talking to someone this morning. You know, when I was a kid, I believed with all my heart, but my strong, sincere belief never did produce a real Santa Claus. It's not about belief. It's not about strong belief, sincere belief. It's about being in alignment with the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. My faith is generated and rises up when I, when I understand the Father is speaking to me. It, it's not just some random, let me flip through and just, oh, there's, there's what I'm claiming for today. No, I, I've, been, I've been in communion with Him. I've been on the mountaintop. I've heard His voice. I've been in season of prayer. And He's spoken in my heart. He said, Mark, I want to tell you this. Thus saith the Lord. And there's, there's my platform for faith to arise because now God has brought a relevant, a timely, a real, a personal word. That's where faith comes from. It's not that I'm just grabbing and hoping and believing sincerely. It's that my Father has spoken to this situation. He's spoken to a multitude lost and looking. There's an answer for that. There may be religious disputes, but my God has an answer for that. If I'm in alignment, I can bring the answer. There's a man, a family that is in distress, but my God, we have the answer. You and I, the church, the church, the church, the people of God, the bride of Christ, if we're in alignment with Him, we have the answer. So what is that answer? This is it. Very last point. You know what the answer is? It's as simple. It's as simple as this. Verse 19. Jesus answered this man. And I personally believe he was talking to his disciples. Giving them another gentle rebuke. Old faithless generation. How long do I have to put up with this? Why don't you get it? Why, why, why is it so hard? Why aren't you seeing this? How long do I have to suffer with this? But notice those last four words. Bring him to me. Bring him to me. This is the answer, church. This is the answer. It's not about what Mark Goins can do. It's not even about what Abundant Life Tabernacle can do. It's not so much about what the church can do. It's about what Jesus can do for them. If we will just bring them to Him. Bring them to Him. You say, I've got grandchildren that are away from the Lord. You know what? You can talk to your blue in the face. You can try to explain. You can argue. You can, you can try to pray condemnation on them. Listen, what you got to do is figure out how to get them to Jesus. That's the answer. Hallelujah. Jesus has all power in heaven and on earth. All authority is given unto Him. He has the answer. If we can just get them to Jesus. Will you stand with me tonight? My prayer, I, I feel like in, in preaching this message is we, we've had moves of God. We've had revival experience. We've, we've enjoyed powerful ministry, the, the word of the Lord, the, the messages and prophecies, all the things that come with, with experiencing a real move of God. Listen, we need that. We want that. But now what do we do with that? That's, that's the, 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 the message that I wanted to bring tonight. you got to get off the mountain. There are times to come down off the mountain because people need what you have. They need what you have. It doesn't matter if you're 13 years old in school. It doesn't matter if you're 90 years old and only your family comes around to see you most of the time. They need what you have. You're, you're here for a reason. God still put breath in your lungs for a reason. Your time's not up. Your story's not over. The Father, He's still writing. The author still has the pen in hand. And while you're here, God's purpose and plan is for you to be a part of what He is doing in this time, this hour. Get them to Jesus. Get them to Jesus. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the the privilege of ministering behind this pulpit and bringing your message. Father, I pray 
I pray that this loud, crazy, spitting guy up here said something to touch somebody and that would cause something to happen in our hearts. That, Lord, we would be stirred, that we would be moved, that we would understand it's an urgency that's in the hour right now, that, Father, you have a plan and you're just looking for someone that will be a part. Join the team. That you'll say, here am I, send me, Lord God, help us to be in alignment with your plan tonight. That we would have understanding. This is why God wants to bless. This is why God has been moving. It's so that I can be a part of what my Father is doing in this hour. Father, use your people, use your church, I pray, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you if you feel that, that need to come tonight, to surrender, to learn, Lord, teach me to be in better alignment. If that's you tonight, I'm urging you to come. Find you an altar. Find you a place of prayer. And seek the face of our God tonight. Lord, give me that desire to hear your voice and to know your plan for me. Come, let's pray tonight, saints of God. Let's pray. Do whatever you